Thank you very much. We turn now to our next item of business, which is topical questions. And we start with question number one from Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with Dumfries and Galloway Council regarding the closure of the new North West Community Campus in Dumfries. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, the safety of students and staff is our primary concern. While this is a matter for Dumfries and Galloway Council, we've been in close contact with the Council and stand ready to provide whatever assistance may be required. Scottish Government officials have undertaken regular discussions with the Council and I have spoken to the Chief Executive of the local authority to discuss the ongoing situation at the campus. We have encouraged the Council to ensure a comprehensive inspection of the condition of the campus is undertaken and ensure that any remedial action is uh, undertaken as a matter of urgency to minimise any impact on children and young people's education. Finlay Carson. And the Cabinet Secretary for that response. It's almost exactly two years ago to the day that there was the sod cutting and the Cabinet Secretary said it marked an exciting milestone for Dumfries. Well, today we mark another chapter in the woeful reputation of Dumfries and Galloway Council. Once again, it seems that defeat has been snatched from the jaws of victory. Parents and staff are hugely concerned that the North West Community Campus is unsafe. We have seen ceilings collapse, a door injuring a child after it came off its rails, and the latest incident saw a child hit by a falling electronic whiteboard. This was after a council officer gave assurances that, and I quote, we've probably done far greater levels of checks now than you might normally have done. Local people and parents are demanding answers. Will the Cabinet Secretary back my calls for a full public inquiry into what's gone wrong at this site and commit to investigate any issues that have risen at any other government-funded schools for the future campuses? Cabinet Secretary. I think the, the, there's a number of elements in Mr Carson's answer, and I'll, I'll work my way through them, Presiding Officer. The first is that, uh, obviously, as I said in my original answer, the safety of students and staff is uh, the absolute concern. So the local authority must satisfy themselves that all um, scrutiny has been undertaken to ensure that the quality of the building is as it should be. And uh, having discussed this matter with Dumfries and Galloway Council, um, there I, I can say I've seen extensive work that has been undertaken to secure the necessary confirmation that the standards of the building are as they should be. Quite clearly, that has not been satisfactory. So the Council must um, and I know they are intent on doing this, uh, hold the contractors to account. Because these are contractual issues. So these are, you know, the, the, none of these things should be anticipated or expected in the delivery of a school building. So the contractor must be held to account on all of this. And the local authority is meeting the contractor at very senior level tomorrow to discuss these questions. In relation to the latter part of uh, Mr Carson's uh, question, um, obviously, there will have to be investigations into what has gone wrong here. Um, the, there will have to be transparency around these issues. And certainly, from the government's perspective, I would expect that to be the case to ensure that we have full information on the issues that have gone wrong here at a very late stage in the contract. It certainly appears to me uh, to provide the reassurance that um, parents, staff and pupils uh, and the local authority have the right to expect. Finlay Carson. With regards to, to safety checks, Dumfries and Galloway Council's website shows that a building completion certificate was granted for the project on the 20th of July. Five days later, a ceiling collapsed at the building after an issue with the sprinkler system. Now, I'm not a builder, but I would imagine that if this school had been filled with pupils and staff, at that time it would have been disastrous. And the council website states that building regulations are in place to make sure the buildings are safe. Now, it strikes me that the process of the Council awarding completion certificates to projects that they have a vested interest in, particularly, and in this case, when they're behind schedule, it could be open to suggestions of possible and potential conflicts of interest. Will the Deputy First Minister give assurance that this process will be reviewed when uh, we're looking at the process of deeming whether buildings are safe for use? Cabinet Secretary. It's really important that we remember what is the purpose of... Um, uh, the certificates that are issued by local authorities. It is to provide confirmation that buildings have been built to the necessary standards and uh, to provide clarity and reassurance on that to members of the public. So a local authority has a statutory duty to undertake that task, independent of whether or not it has an interest in the building. It must provide that assurance. So certainly these issues that are raised by Mr Carson are 
legitimate points to be raised in the discussion that we have about the safety and security of buildings. But what I would say to um, Mr Carson at this stage and to say to Parliament is that fundamentally uh, we rely upon contractors doing the job they are contracted to undertake. Fundamentally that is the issue and yes of course there have to be checks to make sure that has been done. But at this stage it seems to me pretty clear that contractors have let the local authority down and the contractors must be held to account for what has happened in this case. Thank you. There are four other members who wish to ask a question on this. If we are to have a chance of getting to each of them, I would ask all members to keep their questions and ministerial responses short. Uh, Emma Harper. First. Thank you, President Officer. It is extremely concerning that this is the second incident in a three-week period which has resulted in the safety of children and indeed all building users being compromised. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary what action the Scottish Government can take to ensure all future public building works in the southwest of Scotland and indeed across Scotland are inspected and thoroughly checked to ensure they are of the optimal health and safety standard before they are signed off and open to children, teachers and the wider public. Cabinet Secretary. Um, Presiding officer, the Health and Safety at Work Act places a duty on all owners of buildings to ensure that their premises are safe and without risks to, to, to health of anyone involved. Um, in addition to that requirement, which is, applies across all bodies and should apply across the south of Scotland, public sector bodies uh, procuring construction works must have regard to Scottish Government Construction Policy Note 1, oblique 201, 2017. This provides guidance for contracting authorities on making appropriate arrangements for the independent inspection of construction activities. This guidance was prepared following the publication of the report on the independent inquiry into the construction of Edinburgh schools, the Cole report, which reported prior to that notice being produced. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. We have now had three incidents at the new campus, despite assurances being given to the Council on a number of occasions by the private contractors, Graham and Developers Hub South West, that the building was safe. And the Council has now had to bring an independent third party to check the school, which may result in further problems being discovered. And that they've issued the extraordinary statement that they've lost complete confidence in both the contractor and the develop developer. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister, does he have confidence in Graham and Hub South West? And does he share my concern that we do appear to have a government developed procurement process for new schools that does not appear to properly hold private contractors to account for serious breaches of safety? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I expect private contractors to be held to account for contractual failures, which has been the heart of my answers to Mr Carson today. And I made clear to the Chief Executive of the local authority when I spoke to him that I expected the private contractor to be held to account because this is very very basic elementary stuff that no contractor should be failing on in terms of the provision of a uh, public sector building so um, there are contractual arrangements the local i've seen documentary evidence of the local authority being assured by the private contractor and i'll quote from this uh, uh, from this letter uh, graham gives you this is a local authority an unequivocal commitment to provide the council with the facility it expected to have when we entered into the contract. That is an unequivocal co uh, commitment, which I would expect Graham's to be held to. So in all of these matters, I, I, I think there's a, a pretty simple answer, that when people are contracted to build buildings to a certain standard, they should do it. And that would save the, the pupils uh, and the staff of the Northwest campus the great deal of uncertainty and inconvenience that they are facing as a consequence of these issues. Joan McAlpine. Thank you. Professor Cole also produced a report uh, which exposed the failings in the way that Dumfries and Galloway Council officers monitored the contractors at the DG1 Leisure Centre, which was closed for safety reasons. Does the Minister share my concerns that lessons have not been learned from that report? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it's, it's important that when uh, there is material such as the Cole report produced, that we uh, follow and observe those, um, uh, those recommendations and the issues that are raised. What strikes me in the information I've seen in relation to the Fries and Galloway Council's handling of this matter is that they have been given a range of different assurances uh, by the contractor. Um, they have uh, sought to verify those assurances um, and the fact that we are where we are today demonstrates that that process has not been as effective as it should be. 
So I would expect the Fries and Galloway Council uh, to be looking very carefully at the material from the Coal Report and particularly in relation to this process, ensuring that there is effective scrutiny put in place uh, to protect the public interest and to protect the safety of members of staff and pupils uh, at the North West Community Campus. And Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, Professor Cole told the Local Government and Communities Committee last week that it's possible for anyone, uh, myself or yourself, Mr Swinney, to sign a completion certificate. You don't have to have any level of expertise. Anyone can do it. That's wrong, isn't it? Uh, well, I certainly, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't be sitting signing off a completion certificate on a building. Um, I, I think what's important is that any public authority that has a responsibility for the construction of a building makes sure that there is the appropriate expertise in the build, in, within the organisation to ensure that that process is undertaken satisfactorily and in accordance with the requirements of statute and local authorities and other public bodies must take account of their responsibilities in statute to ensure that they are signing off um, particular commitments or um, uh, agreements uh, that they have taken due account of their statutory responsibilities in that respect. Thank you. Question number two, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I should first declare an interest as convener of the cross-party group on animal welfare to ask the Scottish Government whether it will ban the export of livestock for fattening for slaughter. Minister Marie Goujon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm aware of Christine Graham's long-standing interest and commitment to animal welfare, and I know that this is an issue that she has raised in the Chamber on a number of occasions. And I really just want her to know that I share her passion for the welfare of animals, and that's why, in the care of livestock, in all circumstances, we adhere to the highest standards and regulations uh, as issued by the EU. Now, this government recognises, as does the dairy sector and the NFUS, that the issue of male dairy calves is very complex. It's not a black and white situation. There are currently, male dairy calves are currently of no real productive value here in this country, so they do either end up either being slaughtered at birth or exported to other countries, including continental Europe. Now, no one is very comfortable with that situation. So we will work with the sector to look at other options. Now, I'm pleased that this government is supporting the ethical dairy, which is taking a very different approach to dairy cows and their calves. But I do want to make Parliament aware today that P&O ferries have confirmed that they will no longer be transporting live calves from Scotland, which are destined for continental Europe. They've said that they were shocked by the scenes in last night's BBC documentary, and that has, what in, has influenced that decision. Now, I too was shocked, was shocked by the scenes that we saw in the documentary last night, but I have to emphasise that there wasn't anything in that that suggested that any harm had been done or there was any breach of any welfare standards by anyone transporting the calves from Scotland to Northern Ireland, Ireland or to continental Europe. So I am concerned about the decision which has been reached by P&O. Now, I will urgently seek to find out more information about this because obviously we need to determine that there are no other impacts to live transport of animals to Northern Ireland or Ireland, nor indeed for the operation at Cairn Ryan more widely. But I do want to reassure everybody in this chamber today and elsewhere that this government remains absolutely committed to ensuring that livestock in Scotland are reared, transported and treated throughout their lives humanely with respect to the highest possible welfare standards. And just as I made clear to the BBC Scotland in my interview for last night's documentary, if anybody has any evidence that that isn't happening, I would hope that they would come to me with that information. Yeah. Christine Graham. Well, uh, can, I, can I welcome the Minister to her portfolio and thank her for a very thoughtful uh, and, and uh, extensive reply and make it plain that I don't blame the farming community or indeed P&O lines for shipping to Northern Ireland and I do understand EU uh, restrictions. I am pleased to hear her reflect on the ethical farming such as David and Wilma fin Finlay run at the farming gatehouse of Fleet. The question for the government is this, and I ask them this whether they agree with me on this, our concept of animals now as sentient being has changed our whole concept of animal welfare. So there remains widespread, widespread concern about the removal of bull calves, weeks old from their mothers, distressing for both, 
transporting them in some cases over six days, whether or not you agree with the conditions from Scotland, not of course England, to be fattened and slaughtered. So my question to the Scottish Government is in all these circumstances, notwithstanding the welcome words of the Minister, and I hope we do make progress, can her government guarantee the welfare of these calves from removal from their mothers to export through fattening to dispatch in whichever country this takes place? That's the issue, guaranteeing their welfare throughout. Minister. Thank you. Well, that is exactly what we are trying to do. Now, this is something that I'm passionate about and that I very much care about because it is the welfare of the animals that's of paramount importance here. And that is why the Scottish Government has undertaken a project which started in January of this year and is due to run until January next year, where we are monitoring every single stage of that process to ensure that we are adhering to the highest welfare standards that we possibly can and to make sure that we do not end up in a situation where animals are being mistreated. And I have to emphasise that. Now, throughout the project so far, as far as I'm aware, there haven't been any instances of this, but that is exactly why we're undertaking this work to ensure that that doesn't happen. Now, I completely understand how emotive this issue is. There are a lot of strong feelings around it. And especially when, we look, when you look at the number of days or the number of hours that it's seen that animals have to be transported. But within that, I would emphasize as well that half of that time is, uh, is taken for the resting of the animals too. It's not as straightforward uh, as sometimes it's made out to be. Yeah. But we are absolutely committed to upholding the highest animal welfare standards. That's why we're undertaking this project, so we can ensure that that is being done. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much. I didn't really hear a further response to my question about the ethical farming run uh, by the Finlays at Gatehouse of Fleet. It seems to me, if this is replicated throughout Scotland, whether or not there is a ban becomes irrelevant because we won't be using that practice. And ethical farming, where farmers get a proper price for their milk produce, where the bull calves are reeled on the farm till they're six months old and slaughtered in Scotland, removes all necessity for worrying about the transport and what happens to them once they leave our shores. Minister. Thank you. I mean, I would reflect back to my opening statement because, again, the situation that we have at present is something that no one is happy with because ideally we would have a situation where animals are reared and slaughtered as close to where they are produced as possible. We're currently not in that situation but I mean that is why I support and the Scottish Government supports the ethical dairy and why I am keen to engage with the dairy industry and with dairy farmers to see if there is something we can do about this and again I, I would be happy to meet with members in this chamber and again I will be looking to actively engage uh, with the dairy sector so that we can investigate. I mean, I know that other members probably will have been sent the briefing that came around from the NFUS today, where they said the Scottish dairy industry is actively working to reduce the number and find alternative home markets. So I would endorse that and support that work, and that is really what we're keen to do. Can I, uh, can I welcome, we've obviously had uh, uh, very full questions and very full and detailed answers, which I have to say, we will be welcomed by all members. However, there are five more members. There's clearly a huge amount of interest in this subject. I don't think there's a chance of getting through all five, but if we have succinct questions, succinct answers, we'll get through a few. Uh, Mark Ruskell first. Thank you. Um, the Minister has just repeated the assertion that she made on the BBC last night, which is that she had no knowledge that these animals were being transported to North Africa. I find it's difficult to believe, given that a letter was sent to the First Minister detailing these transports back in the spring. Does the Minister now acknowledge that there is a huge difference, a huge difference between a ferry trip of sheep from the Shetland Isles and a 135-hour journey that sheep and dairy calves are making through to Spain and onwards to Africa, and that a ban on live exports will not lead to a ban on imports, on, sorry, exports of cattle and sheep within the UK? Minister. I would highlight that one thing we specifically, or I specifically asked the BBC for when I undertook that interview was if they had any evidence of our cattle being transported or, being, or ending up in countries outside the EU to hand that to us. As yet, I haven't received any evidence to that. And as I said, we are undertaking this project, which is running for a year, to monitor the situation, to see exactly what is happening. Now, and as a result of that, I have not seen any evidence that that has what that that is what is taking place, as the member suggests. Again, if there is evidence to the contrary, I'm happy to receive it. Edward Mountain. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. This Parliament requires me to make a declaration of my interest, and I wish to do so it's slightly longer than I would normally do, considered the emotiveness of this subject. I am part of a family partnership producing beef cattle. We sell breeding cattle mainly within the UK and Ireland. The disclosure programme aired last night does not accurately reflect the high standards of welfare within the industry in Scotland that I have known and worked in for the 39 years of my working life. I would like to ask the Minister, will she be working with the UK Government to ensure that the high standards that are practised in the, in the UK in our farming industry are replicated across the world? Minister. I I thank the member for that question and that is again a hark back to this project that we're currently undertaking because that is exactly what we want to do. I, we have a proud record of, of animal welfare standards in Scotland at the moment and I believe that this study is the first of its kind anywhere else in the world and we could well learn lessons from that and therefore improve the, the legislation and the regulations that we have at the moment. It is absolutely of paramount importance to me that we maintain high standards in Scotland. So, of course, I'll be doing everything we can, regardless of what happens to Brexit, to make sure we maintain those high standards. My grumbles. In this chamber on the 6th of June, I said to Fergus Ewing, the concern is not about direct exports from Scotland, but about Scottish animals ending up in Spain and North Africa for slaughter. He avoided answering my question. Check the official report. There is an alternative to slaughtering calves at a few weeks old. That's to rear them here for veal production and to promote this for the UK con consumer. The Minister just said she'll do everything she can to maintain high standards. Could I ask her, will the Scottish Government, will she take positive action to promote the consumption of Scottish veal by the UK consumer so we can make this productive for farmers? Minister. I thank the member for that question and as I said in an earlier answer, I'm absolutely open to looking at all alternatives, engaging with the industry to see what we can do. Um, because again, it's a situation that not everyone is happy with and I'm absolutely committed to doing that, engaging with the industry to see how we can move forward positively. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, building on the previous questions, last night's BBC Disclosure Programme highlighted, as we've heard, the Galloway Farm of Wilmer and David Finlay, um, who, who I visited in South Scotland. And they do have an ethical system, and the losses from the lower milk yield through selling uh, the, the male cows at 18 months, instead of them either being shot or at birth or transported at up to four weeks, um, could make up the, the difference. So in, in the interim, will the Scottish Government consider the possibility of actually supporting uh, the development of these herds through possible transition subsidies? And also, will the Minister agree with me that surely the only way to stop this is to ban live exports, as Scottish Labour and uh, some other opposition parties, such as the Greens, think we should be doing. Minister. I would say that, again, the issue isn't as black and white as that because we export animals for a whole variety of different reasons. And as far as I'm aware from some organisations, well, we, we transport we transport animals for further production, we transport animals for breeding as well, which I believe is something that not all organisations have an issue with. And when it comes to the ethical dairy, they're a business that I've yet to meet, but I'm very keen to meet with them and to do that as soon as possible. And again, when it comes to alternatives, as I said in uh, previous responses, I'm happy to investigate this and to look at other alternative <coughs> solutions so we can find a positive way forward. Thank you, and we'll hear from Emma Harper as well. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I've listened carefully to the Christine Graham's questions as well as the Minister's response, and I would be happy to introduce her to David and Wilma Finlay for a visit to the South West. Um, but I'm interested to know whether the, uh, the Minister is uh, supporting the NFU Scotland's call for sound science and existing standards to be the basis of discussions prior to any changes to live export regulation. Minister. Again, I talked about the Scottish Government project that's currently underway and I would reference that again. That's exactly why we are undertaking that work to see, uh, to actually get all that scientific evidence, to get the data, uh, to see what improvements we need to make, if any. And I also gratefully accept Emma Harper's invitation uh, to visit the, the ethical dairy. And again, that's something I'm keen to do and to look at all these other alternatives. Thank you very much and that concludes topical questions and uh, thank all the members and the ministers in fact for uh, 
extending what was clearly a, a lot of political interest